Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to say that some of us are very happy to be back here and uh, nice to be here for a visit. And, uh, I was a little nervous when Dad asked me to uh, teach. I don't teach too terribly often. And it's been a while since I've been here, so uh, y'all just keep me in prayers, maybe the uh, Lord can uh, just manage to use me. And, uh, if you turn your Bibles over to the book of Exodus, we're uh, going to be beginning reading in chapter 11. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I was uh, trying to pray and think about what to uh, teach on, and this just kind of uh, was put on my heart. And I always uh, end up questioning probably what I'm going to teach more than maybe I should if the Lord put on my heart. But uh, went over to Old Christopher's uh, this afternoon, and turns out he's been teaching the same thing over there. And it's nice for the last few weeks, so it's kind of interesting to compare notes and stuff. And, uh, but anyways, uh, we're going to start reading, and we've got quite a bit to read. I don't know how far we'll actually get, and how much, depends on the time we have. But if, uh, we're going to start reading verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, uh, And the Lord said unto Moses, uh, Yet uh, will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you hence. Uh, when he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people. Let every man borrow of his neighbor, uh, and every woman, every woman of her neighbor, jewels and silver, and jewels of gold. And the Lord uh, gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Uh, moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, and in the sight of Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's servants, in the sight of the people. Uh, and, okay, so uh, anyways, this is all uh, fairly familiar passage of scripture. I'm sure everybody. This is the tail end of the plagues that were brought upon Egypt uh, uh, by the hand of God using Moses uh, whenever he was, whenever the Lord was liberating his people from uh, the Egyptians and as you see he's bringing one more plague and I'm sure we all know it's the plague of the death of the firstborn uh, the firstborn child and uh, so that's all pretty familiar stuff but, uh, just touch base there and then we'll continue reading uh, in verse 4 it says uh and Moses said, uh, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I, go out, uh, will I go out of the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die, and the firstborn of Pharaoh that sits upon the throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is uh, behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beast. And uh, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. Uh, but against uh, the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against a man uh, or beast, that you may know that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians uh, and Israel. So, uh, again, this uh, just uh, puts it in plain writing. This was the death of the first uh, firstborn child. And we see that it was, uh, it was stretched out over uh, everyone without distinction in Egypt. We see it was from the the mightiest, which was Pharaoh's own household, his his child, and certainly Pharaoh in that time was likely the most powerful man not only in Egypt but in the entire world at that point. And but it went all the way down to even uh, the firstborn of, of the animals, even below uh, human beings themselves. That uh, took the lowliest uh, servant all the way down even to the beast. There was no one spared uh, from this judgment, but. As, as we saw in verse 7, it said, against the children of Israel, not even a dog would move its tongue. So, we see even the lowliest animal in Israel would not even be disturbed by this. And I, I love how the Bible puts it uh, there at the end of verse 7. It says, uh, uh, that you may know the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And uh, I don't think, uh, you know, all through the Old Testament, a lot of people want to dismiss the Old Testament as just old writings that, you know, have no consequence now. But everything in Scripture points to Christ. And nothing... I don't think there's any more clear picture of election than right there. That there's a, it wasn't anything, any merit of the, Israel, the Israelites, and uh, but but God had put a difference between them. He, yeah. he there was a difference, and He had set them apart. And again, most of us know the story, and we'll, and we'll read later on where uh, the the Israelites had work to do. They had to put the you know blood, and that was obviously to the of the blood of Christ, but it, that's, you know, it's almost, you know, you can't, again, we'll get to all that. I'll, 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 I'll put off that for now. We'll get back to it here in just a few minutes. But just bear that in mind. And we'll continue reading, uh, and let's see, uh, I guess verse 8, yes. And, uh, all, uh, and all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow, uh, bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out 
and all the people that follow thee, and after that uh, will I go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, uh, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses uh, and Aaron uh, did all these wonders uh, before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so he did not let the children of Israel go out of his land. So uh, just a, a side note to those few verses there. Uh, Certainly, uh, you know, I believe if, if Moses, I mean, if Pharaoh had not been influenced by the Lord, you would think surely he would have let the people go. Because certainly there had been warning after warning after warning in the previous plagues of, you know, if you don't let us go, this is going to happen. And inevitably it always happened. So, you know, you think just practically Moses is like, well, you know, the Pharaoh would have been like, well, if he's threatening this and it's always come true, I'm just going to let him go. And there's no point of risking it. But we see the Lord harden his heart. And, you know, I, I believe that was, like, like I said, I believe that was beyond even what a, a man would reason within himself. But the Lord hardened his heart. And the, the reason, the very reason for it was that it says right there in verse 9, it says uh, that my wonders may multiply the land of Egypt. God was displaying his power through Pharaoh. And uh, just, again, as a sign of that, was, it kind of came to me, you know, we need to be very careful when uh, in our walk with Christ that we constantly, that we intentionally try to display Christ in our life because uh, Christ is going to be glorified. And in this case, he was glorified, but it was at Pharaoh and all the people in land, uh, Egypt's, uh, and all the people in the land of Egypt's expense. So mm -hmm. be careful to glorify God and show him in your life because there could be consequences otherwise. And then uh, we continue reading over into verse 12, or chapter 12, and it says, uh, in verse 1 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses uh, and Aaron, uh, I'm sorry, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, uh, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take uh, to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, and, uh, and lamb, a lamb for a, for, a, for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him... And his neighbor next uh, unto his house, take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating uh, shall, uh, shall make your count for the lamb. Uh, your lamb shall be without blemish, uh, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats. So uh, we see the beginning of the instructions that the, Isra uh, that the Israelites had to carry out was to uh, take this lamb. Now, uh, again, talking of fish fry, I didn't really... Excuse me, pick up on this. I mean, obviously, most of us, again, being familiar with this, see the lamb as a typification of Christ. But right. if you look down through this, in every situation now, there was a, a lamb for every household. And if the household was small, they could, they could kind of co-op together on a lamb. But in every instance where speaking of the lamb in this, it uses a singular term. It doesn't talk about, you know, the lambs or the whole big pile of lambs or anybody. It's always singular, you know, the lamb, your lamb. It's always singular, which I think is very interesting. And, you know, so there was only certainly one sacrifice that Christ had to make. And it was only one lamb. So I thought that was kind of an interesting point that well, Christopher kind of told me he saw. And then another thing I saw was, um, I think, further points to Christ. is In verse 5 it says, uh, your lamb shall be without blemish. And obviously Christ certainly was. Male the first year, uh, and you shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats. Now, if you look at uh, a lot of religions, and like uh, one thing that jumps right to my mind is even uh, Islam believes in Christ, that he lived, that he was even a, a good prophet, but they don't see him as a deity, as Christ as God himself. And right there it says it's separated from the sheep and from the goats. Now, certainly in, 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 in the Bible, goats are certainly uh, most often referred to as as unelect or unsanctified people. And certainly, even Christians are separated from that. But it's, we see that this particular lamb is even separated from the sheep. He's not even like a good Christian. He's, not, he's, he's even separated beyond that. And I think that just points to Christ because certainly he was down among us. He, was, he came in flesh, but he was separated out from us. He was, he was different. He was, he was unique, and he had to be separated for the sacrifice. So again, I think that just uh, beautifully points toward Christ. Then we uh, pick up back again in verse 6, and it says, And he shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel uh, shall kill it in the evening. Now again, uh, not to be a dead, uh, dead, a dead dog, but uh, again, this just points to Christ. 
Because if you look at, again, if we're going through verse 6, it says, You shall keep it from the fourteenth day of the month. So it had a time that it was among the people. And then it says, And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, again, as I said before, there were just undoubtedly thousands and thousands of these sheep that were sacrificed uh, for this purpose. But as I mentioned before, it, you know, it uses it in the singular. It says, uh, And the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it, you know, singular. And plus, the whole congregation of Israel shall kill it. Now, me and Chris were talking about that, and I don't believe that all of Israel got together with their knife, put their hand on the same knife, and killed the same sheep. So certainly that didn't happen. But, you know, there's no mistakes in the word of God whatsoever. And if you look at the way it's written, the whole, the whole of Israel killed each sheep, symbolically, I believe. And certainly that's the same with Christ. All of Israel, and all of mankind for that matter, killed Christ. And it was for our redemption, and we didn't realize at the time, but I just believe that points to Christ so beautifully because uh, certainly that's that's what happened to Christ. And it just, and, you know, again, there's no mistakes in the word, just the, just the verbiage that it uses just points to that. I thought that was really, really interesting. And then I'll continue reading in verse 7, and it says, And you shall take the blood and strike it uh, on two posts. And on the upper post of the house wherein uh, ye shall eat it. So uh, they bark the blood over the top and down the sides of the door, uh, symbolizing the covering of the blood. And uh, going on down in verse 8, it says, uh, And thou shalt eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and bitter herbs shall ye eat it. Uh, eat not it raw or sodden at all with water. Uh, but roasted with fire, his head with his legs, and with the uh, putrids uh, uh, thereof, and ye shall, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it in the morning shall ye burn with fire. So, you know, when we first start reading that, you know, they say, you know, you're supposed to roast the flesh. And like, oh, man, that's not too bad. I mean, I'm not a lamb fan, but, you know, roasted meat, that's not too bad. But you start reading on down there, it definitely was not a pleasant meal, you know. Uh, our unleavened bread is not not supposed to be appetizing. I know that the that this Passover meal was a separate thing, but by the, but by the same thing, it's not supposed to be something we sit around and enjoy. And if you and certainly this would not have been an enjoyable meal. Right. It was made with bitter herbs. So that right there wasn't good. And actually, and I was looking up that putrids. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but uh, in in my Bible, and I think through Strong's, it's uh, that's the intestines and everything was cooked right along with it. And they were supposed to eat all of it. Now, there was, a, there was a provision made that they didn't eat all they had to just to burn it. But certainly they were to attempt to eat all of it. So, I mean, it, was, it definitely was not a, a, uh, a pleasant meal whatsoever. And another thing that, and y'all that are more studied than me might be able to shed some on this, but I just thought it was interesting. It kind of just jumped out at me. In verse 9 it says, uh, uh, eat it not raw or sodden with water, uh, at all with water. Uh, so the sod is supposed to be, it was, I guess, boiled. You're not supposed to boil it. Right. And I just thought it was interesting because if you look at the, at the lamb that took the case of Christ, when he was on the cross, they, they speared him in the side, and the blood and water came forth. And certainly I believe that uh, part of that was that all the blood had to be shed. And I certainly believe that was probably, it might have been the only reason, but I just think it was interesting that you know, it says that the water came forth, and then in this instance, you're not supposed to have any water in it whatsoever. So I just, I don't know, it, it's probably nothing, but I just thought it was kind of an interesting thing. It kind of just jumped out at me, so I just thought I'd make mention of it. Uh, and then we'll uh, pick up back in verse 11. It says, uh, And this shall you eat it with your loins girded, uh, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. Uh, uh, it is the Lord's Passover. So uh, there was a, not only was there a particular thing that way that they had to prepare it and do with the blood, but they also had to eat it in a certain way. And uh, I was kind of came to my mind whenever I was reading this when it says, you guys shall eat it in haste. And uh, we, We're often made fun of because we eat so fast. And I'm not uh, encouraging that whatsoever. It's not a very good way to eat. But uh, what came to my mind was uh, the reason that uh, me, and I mean like my, me and my brother and sister and all that, uh, eat so fast now is when we were younger, mom always had a lot going on, there was a lot of stuff to do, so usually when we ate, we had somewhere to be. So we had to eat quickly to, to get done and be ready to go. And I believe that's the same reason that they were told to eat quickly here, eat in haste. And you see that their loins are girded, which I guess is just their raiment and whatever the you know, possessions they carry with them, their shoes on their feet, their staff in their hand. They were to eat this as if at any moment they had to depart. And, uh, and certainly that's the same thing with us. And you don't have to uh, turn over there if you want. I have a little marker in here somewhere so I can 
she can get there a little quick. But in First Thessalonians in chapter five, let's read a couple verses there. And it says, uh, "But of the time and season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Uh, for when they shall say peace and safety, and the sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape." But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, but they should, take you, should overtake ye as a thief. Uh, for ye are children of the light, and children, and children of the day. Uh, we, are not, uh, we are not of the night, uh, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us uh, watch and be sober. And uh, uh, one thing that I, that I was looking at this was, uh, you know, it says, that put up time season, but brethren, you have no need to write of you. Uh, I don't believe that saying that the brethren knew necessarily, I mean, I believe there are signs of the Bible we can look for, but we don't know the time or the place it's going to happen. That's clearly written in the scriptures. But the reason that I think it says that you have no need that I write unto you is because you're supposed to be in a prepared state regardless. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but, uh, you know, if, 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 if the Lord should come now or even 2,000, I don't believe it be any remotely this long, but 2,000 years from now, it, should be, it shouldn't matter. It should not matter because we should be in a position where he could come back at any moment and we would be ready. And that's, I think that's the picture here in Exodus, in the Passover, is that they were, they were prepared and ready to go whenever the Lord would call upon them. And I just have a couple more verses I want to read here. It says, uh, and, I'll, and I'll pass through the land of Egypt uh, this night and smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgment. I am the Lord. And the Lord shall be with you for a, uh, for a token upon the houses uh, where you are. And when I, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you and destroy you uh, when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, what, uh, one thing I wanted to point out here was uh, he said, You come through and smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, uh, both man and beast. And I, I like this one says, Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgment. Now, I don't believe he's saying that the gods of Egypt were real or even were a force to be reckoned with, but his, his and it's, you know, says, I am the Lord. His sheer might of his word and him uh, executing his judgment against Egypt would just smite and put down their uh, fake gods, the ones that they served, you know, that I'm sure that the Egyptians would turn to for protection. He would just put them down and there just no match, no uh, consequence. And uh, again, in verse 13, and again, this is just kind of a side note. It doesn't really bear a lot of significance. But in my mind, when I've always heard this story, and I've always kind of, in my mind, pictured you know, the death angel going through and taking everybody out. And I believe that was part of it, but it's not all of it. It says, uh, and, uh, and the blood shall be for you, and a token upon your house, uh, where you are. And when I see the blood, and this is the Lord talking, Amen. I will pass over to you. And I'm, I'm, I didn't write this down. I should have, but I'm going to... Uh, Look this up real quick. Uh, yeah, in verse 23 of the same chapter says, The Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and upon the two posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come. So uh, uh, my whole point of bringing that out was, again, in my mind, I think some people are the same because I know Christopher was sharing the same uh, thing. I've always just pictured the death angel coming through, but it wasn't. The Lord was going through Right. And he would let, yep, this one doesn't have the blood. I haven't, I haven't covered this house, and the, and the death angel would go in there and take the first one. And, and the Lord saw, and, you know, the Lord saw the blood, he would pass over uh, uh, his people. And, again, uh, uh, I think the biggest, the biggest thing that stood out to me about this is the separation from the Egyptians and the Israelites. And that came long before even the blood was applied to the Lord. It was a distinction already made. And me and Christopher had this conversation, and I, you know, if if an Egyptian had just randomly put the blood on the door, I don't want to really what would happen. And and putting all that aside, look at it this way: it's it, again, it's a beautiful picture of election because I don't believe an Egyptian would have done it. That's kind of the point because it was already predestined that only the Israelites would have been saved. And by the same token, if an Israelite hadn't put the blood on the door, I don't know what would have happened, but it, it wouldn't have happened that way because they were determined and predestined to put that blood on the door. So I just thought this was. Uh, some interesting points that were kind of new to me from this passage, and uh, I know it was uh, very short tonight. I hope uh, the Lord's able to use some of it, and um, I guess I'll just turn back over to you and dismiss however y'all are uh, used to. So, thank you.